C-SPAN 2, a public service created by America's cable television companies. We're going to pause at this break in the hearing to check our early morning C-SPAN 2 programming schedule for you. We're going to continue with this hearing conducted by a pair of House subcommittees on the financial condition of the District of Columbia. Then, just before 6.30 this morning, Eastern Time, Religion in Schools is debated by religious broadcaster Pat Robertson and Nadine Strassen of the American Civil Liberties Union. At 7.30 this morning, we'll talk with the leader of Great Britain's Liberal Democrats Party, Patty Ashdown. And then this morning at 8, we will begin live coverage of a forum on welfare reform conducted by the American Public Welfare Association. Among those scheduled to be at this four-hour event are Health and Human Services Secretary Donna Shalala. And that's a brief look at our C-SPAN 2 schedule. We return now to the hearing on the financial condition of the nation's capital. The, um, the meeting will uh, reconvene. Mr. Clark, I apologize. As you know, we were in such a hurry uh, to get out of here with the vote and everything else. I know there, you wanted to respond to a couple of questions. I want to give you uh, some opportunity now to make right, some thanks. comments. And then if the mayor would like to uh, either address Mrs. Collins' comments or any of the other questions that were made before we proceed with our questioning, I want to give you ample opportunity to do so. We appreciate you being back here with us. Well, uh, I did uh, want to respond to uh, con con uh, con Congressman Dick Dixon's uh, uh, points. Sure. When we were putting the fiscal year 1994-95 supplemental together, at a staff level, we made an inquiry as to try to get into some interpretation of the $140 million uh, uh, requirement. It was clear that it was not to be taken out of revenues, um, but, uh, and it was clear that it had to be taken out of expenditures. But we inquired as to whether if additional revenues came in, uh, was there latitude to use them as well as expenditure cuts beyond the $140 million to address what had been noted at the same time as the Congress voted the fiscal year 1995 budget itself uh, of under budgeting problems. And that's the course that we went upon in the Council. Uh, we did set, pro provide for the $140 million uh, non-expenditure and then we took the differences plus the increased revenues and applied them to the problems uh, that we had noted. So I guess I, I, I put that point on the record as to why we did that that way and get any uh, further guidance uh, from the Congress as to what to do in the future about that because we intend to meet that. Right. Secondly, um, uh, Congressman Dixon raised again the point that the GAO said that we had come under, by, uh, we were at $99 million. And I had referenced that in my uh, opening statement about the $79 million. Again, if I can get some guidance, it's no problem to go through the next supplemental and just withdraw that budget item for the $79 million. Then it'll just be there. It won't be, hopefully it won't be spent. I, I think you clarified that uh, adequately uh, for the record. I don't know how other members feel, but I think you, you, you clarified that item. The 79 million and how so it should the, be carried. The seven, you're, you're treating the 79 million, although its budget is really, is really a cut. Uh, I, I think we can call it that way. It may take a formal designation by council. I'm satisfied that it's cash available for whatever, for, for deficit uh, reduction or paying bills, which you may end up using it for anyway. I don't want uh, I don't want our f fiscal year 96 uh, federal payment being embargoed. Well, because Mr. Walsh's committee will make that call, but I think okay. you put on the record that the availability of that money. You I'm, I'm sorry, on this point, uh, could, you, could you restate it? Seven. Congressman I was, Walsh, I was trying to get a little give a bit of guidance with I'm respect to, yes, to the $79 million <laughs> that we budgeted yeah. for cash reserve. If it's going to be treated as a budget item, as an expenditure item, as apparently GAO has done that, and therefore we fall out of uh, compliance with the 140 and we get a fine, so to speak, in the fiscal year 1996 budget, I can simply, in the next supplemental, take out that appropriation for the cash reserve. I did it as a matter of discipline uh, uh, in there, but it's, it's like the act of discipline to set it aside has become, in the way things are working out, uh, a deficiency on our part. Well, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure exactly how it would be handled, but certainly I applaud the effort to set some cash aside for a, uh, for a rainy day. Um, I, Not a rainy day fund. Uh, all right, well. Cash reserve. 
Pardon? Cash reserve. Rainy day right. fund was to spend for things that was needed. Cash reserve is not to spend. Right. The, the, the problem is, I think that, that uh, and I can't speak for Congressman Dixon, but the problem was that we weren't at the $140 million level. Yeah. Part of that was revenues that were raised, and that was not part of the deal. That's right. That's right. But if you count that 79 as, as a cut, uh, then we are at the $140 million level, and we're, at the, we're under the 3.2 level. And that's why I'm concerned, because we're going to have another budget. And I've been very diligent in what the council does, meeting that 140 requirement you've set. Well, even, even that aside, we're still over the authorized level for, of spending uh, for this year. Uh, not, if you, not if you don't treat that as an expenditure, we're not, sir. Because you still have the Medicaid issue. Uh -huh. the, if I read page 12 of the uh, GAO correctly, if, they, may, I'm sorry. I think you made a statement earlier that you may have misspoken. You, we talked about the three. You may have misspoken. You, we talked about the 3.8 billion level of spending, and then you talked about the 79 million that you set aside for cash, and somehow you got to 3.1 billion from 3.8 billion. Obviously, it's 800 million, not 80 million. All right. But let me just say, I think your question so, so about not being penalized for the 79 million is put squarely on the record. I think we recognize that. All right, thank you. And, okay. and I appreciate that clarification. Okay, thank you. Chairman. Yeah, Ms. Mayor. Uh, before uh, Mr. Dixon had, had, had made a statement about management, let me just say that uh, I don't believe, at least under my administration, I can't speak for anybody else's administration, every controller in the D.C. government and every director that I have hired knows that you can't take this budget situation lightly. You can't go around and just go spend money. We have several situations that, in my view, don't have much to do with management. It has to do with budget. We may differ on how much Medicaid money we need, but we all agree that the Medicaid budget uh, has been under budgeted compared to spending. That's not a management issue, that's a budget issue. If you were adequately budgeted at say $406 million for 94, you wouldn't have overspent. The second issue is court orders. If you have a court order which has a constitutional basis for it, which says that money and budget is no defense against a court order, you have to then spend that money. And that's not management, that's court order on the budget end. Uh, my attitude is that all of our managers are committed to staying within their budget if the budget is a, is a real budget. So I don't want anybody to leave thinking that we have managers who just say, well, heck with that, and I'm going to just go do what I can. They cannot do it. The third point, even as uh, inadequate as our system is, in order to overspend in your control center area or your, your budget area, you have to get someone to override that system. You can't just, just do it. So for instance, Public Works last year overspent by $20, $25 million. And we look at that, we found that people at the very high levels of government overrode the system. That was a decision made that I wouldn't have made uh, to spend money during this election year. So we do that. The second part of what we ought to... Mr. Mayor, with all due respect, didn't most of the agencies go over their budget last year? I don't know about uh, most. Uh, I, 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 much of this, uh, in, in fairness, before you took office, but as, as I look at even the spending cuts that the council passed in December, those weren't implemented until... I don't know if they're still implemented, but I know they weren't implemented for a couple of months. To me, that's a management problem, not a budget problem. Maybe I'm missing something. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't either. In the sense that the Medicaid budget was overspent, uh, DHS overspent by $70 million. Right. No, no uh, question that's a problem. You put yeah, that on the table. Public Works, uh, for the last two or three years, has been under-budgeted and, and doing budget things that uh, didn't make a lot of sense. Human Services overspent. Public works overspent, fire, public schools, uh, settlements and judgments, police, 
Yeah. Well, uh, these were the numbers you showed us uh, informally. I, not the other one, uh, Ms. Ms. Chairman, is my understanding that working on the numbers that the Congress had at the time, which was a uh, three billion three ninety four. That the that's, Congress's that's mandate was that by the end of the fiscal year, 95, the D.C. government had to reduce its budget by $140 million. That's my understanding of the congressional mandate. And reduce its spending in terms of employees by 2000 Assuming we didn't have these over-expenditures carried over and we were down to the three point three nine four million dollar starting figure which we weren't everybody right. knows that we would still have some time from October 1st until now you save X amount of money and then from this point on till September 30th you say why am I don't think anybody would expect us to have saved the hundred forty million dollars even if we were on budget would you that's it will be saved by the end of fiscal year well I I think there are two issues here, and I don't want to dwell on this, but the, the fact is that when Congress was writing the law, they didn't just write it as a $140 million reduction, and Mr. Walsh will correct me if I'm wrong, but they put that number of uh, $3.25 billion in because I think they probably didn't trust the numbers they were given from the city at that time, uh, and they wanted to write in a bottom line figure. That bottom line figure now is grossly over overextended, uh, and we are stuck Under as understood. a Congress with... with um, uh, with legislation that mandates reductions from that number, not from the 140 million. That's our dilemma, and I just wanted to share that with you. But, uh, and we, I think we both agree, though, that the 140, assuming the budget was balanced, the numbers were correct at the beginning, which we now know they were not. They were three million, three nine four. We would still have some time in this fiscal year to reduce it by 140. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying, what I'm saying, is that <coughs> thus far, uh, we have reduced this budget. Uh, by approximately seventy million dollars at this point, and we intend to either through new renegotiations that the council wants us to, or through legislation, reduce it another seventy million dollars or actual real hard cash by wages being reduced in our employee base. Our employee base is one point four billion dollars to the personal services, and ten percent that'll be one forty and five percent is seventy million, and then we're going to do a number of other. Uh, uh, service reductions in terms of closing clinics and, and rotating you know, fire companies and a lot of other stuff. But all I'm telling you is that from, from the congressional perspective, and this was passed before I was a member here, but I'm learning quick, there, there are two sides to it. One is the, the $140 million reduction, but you also had the $3.25 billion and you could not exceed that. Right. Either one of those triggers a uh, downslide in the payment uh, to the district. Oh, yeah. Assuming you get to the $140 million, Right. Assuming you get there and you're making the case that you can get there, you still have a, a give back, if you will, uh, because of the $3.25 billion. And the reason that number was put in there, I believe, was because Congress was not satisfied with the baseline number from the district. And just to make sure that the numbers that the city at that point s swore were true, they put the bottom line number in. And that, that's the dilemma we face. And, and, and now it's your problem, and I understand, but I just wanted to put it in perspective. Um, Mr. Davis, uh, every year the Congress puts an authorized budget that you can't exceed on everybody's budget. Uh, and it has now become complicated and difficult because the original number that you all thought you were starting with was not accurate. It's not your fault. It's the fact that the district gave you a number that was not accurate. And you started with what you thought was an accurate number and went down. What we're saying, now we know it's not accurate, we're going to ask the Congress, who certainly has the authority, to increase that number from 3.254 to 3.521 as a budget authority. Right, I understand. Okay, I think we've just... Yeah, we got that straight on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, if it, I'd like to move on to other committee members and allow them an opportunity uh, to speak. Mrs. Collins had asked the last questions. I don't know if you want to answer those. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Let now. me uh, answer those questions. Uh, one question was that the district's interim chief financial officer said last Friday that there's now a financial monitoring team of senior officials in place under the direction of the city administrator, which will constantly oversee the implementation of new spending reduction. Exactly how this team accomplishes this task. Uh, David uh, Domenici, where's David? 
Senator. Mr. Chairman David, stand up, everybody can see you, David. You the, the, the czar here on this thing. Uh, knows every agency's budget. We've agreed on these budgets. I've sat down and personally gone through each of these budgets with each of these agencies. And I just give uh, uh, police as an example. That's a, that's a rather easy one. Uh, their budget is $230 million for FY95. Chief Thomas knows that's his budget. And then it's, it's divided up into a, a plan to stay within the budget. For instance, we're freezing hiring police officers for the rest of this year. Uh, there'll be attrition of other officers as they go out. I still will be 3,900. So on a weekly basis, David sits with the chief and his financial people and say, how close are you to your plan? And I tell you how it works. The police department's budget for overtime for 95 was 7 point, we'll just say 7.1, 7.5 million dollars. The chief got his report and saw that it spent almost 5 million already. He cut out uh, the ability to have any discretion over time, the ability to even uh, to question like this to go to court on your off days. And so the way it's implemented, when you get close to what your mark is, uh, there's a, uh, a flag that goes up. And you can't exceed it. If you do, you've got to come see me and the city administrator about why you're doing that. So it is in place. It is working uh, at that time. So it is a, a way of controlling spending in line with our spending plans. I'll give you another example of how it works. The uh, Department of Correction wanted to reduce this budget by $25 million. We told them to do that. They had to do it to come to $240 million as opposed to 265. Part of that plan was to close one of our facilities called the Modular at Lorton and transfer those 688 people from Lorton to, the, to DC's correctional treatment facility, double bunking. The judge stopped us. So again, David found that out, Ms. Moore knew about that, and we're now devising an alternative plan to do the same thing another way. That's how that process works. It's a very good process, and it's permanent. Uh, it wasn't there when I came in. It was not the discipline there that I think we should have had. So it is permanent, the, uh, and it has all of my authority that goes with it. Mr. Mayor, just to tack on to what Mrs. Uh, Collins had asked, do you have the information technology that you need, or I think you said earlier you probably needed some updates in that uh, that would assist you even more with this kind of thing? We have enough to control this spending now. We need a different kind of system to give us a whole range of information. For instance, we ought to be able to age our accounts payable. We, we don't have the technology to do that. We ought to be able to know, we ought to have a system that when you order something, you obligate it, then the moment it comes in, the day it comes in, ought to be a way that you enter that into the system saying we've now received it and it's now something we've got to pay. And you start counting the day it came in to the time it gets paid as opposed to now, the, the agencies may hold it for 25 days or 10 days. That's not the way it ought to be. And those are some of them. We ought to have a system that can tell us instantly uh, the, the projections on, on, on personnel by appropriations or by federal funds, those kind of things. Uh, but we can control this spending with what we have, but we need an enhanced system that will give us all the kind of of collective information the General Accounting Office said that we ought to have, that we want to have. Okay. Okay. The other, other question was the federal payment. You ought to know my view about that. That the uh, federal government, uh, is presence here, contributes to over 57% uh, of the land being non-taxable. Well, we ought to have 43% of that land we can tax. It ought to be a formula-based federal payment that's predictable or that we can all count on. And I know that uh, we had it for the last three, four years. This year's federal payment for 96 is fixed. We would hope that the committee would look at going back to some form of formula so it, it can be predictable as a percentage of our revenues. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Wong. I'd like to recognize Mr. Benia for questions. Mr. Benia. Thank you, Chairman. And I recall at 9 o'clock this morning, just looking around this room and seeing how it was packed from wall to wall and there were people waiting out in the hallway to come in and 
Chairman Clark uh, investing a yet another big chunk of his time on, a, on a, trying to deal with this crisis, and Mayor Barry was here and from the beginning, and I noticed Chief Thomas sitting in that seat for going on five hours now, and probably one of the most uncomfortable chairs you could find in Washington. But uh, what the point I'm making is it, it's, it's kind of baffling to sit here and look at everyone who cares so much about the District of Columbia as every member on this committee uh, cares as well, but yet still there's a crisis that seems to be almost never-ending. Um, my history on this committee has been one of trying to be helpful in, in, in the committee's, uh, uh, in the District of Columbia's efforts to solve problems, and I want to continue to do that. Uh, I want to make a, a suggestion here and, and uh, some comments that I have, uh, because there have been a lot of uh, discussions lately about everything from taking over the control of the District of Columbia, which I do not support, and, and frankly, I don't think a majority of uh, members on either side of the aisle support anything like that, because uh, I think the last thing we want to do is try to micromanage uh, your business, because you know your community better than anyone here. Uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't want to micromanage your business any more than uh, you'd want to micromanage the business of Hondo, Texas. Uh, it's just not uh, practical. Many have had suggestions. Uh, former HUD Secretary Kemp and uh, my colleague, Representative Norton, have proposed some very interesting ideas that could revitalize the economy. And, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's helpful to have these ideas and that we all share them. I have a, a proposal today and an idea that I'd like to ha have considered because I've seen it work in uh, so many communities, including my hometown of San Antonio, Texas. And I ask that, uh, uh, that we all consider uh, the council manager form of municipal government. In this form of government, as you've probably looked at this uh, system and, and trying to f look at different alternatives to solve your problems, day-to-day -day operations are transferred to a hired professional, a city manager. A city manager would be responsible for the bureaucratic structure presently controlled by the mayor. The manager would be hired and accountable to the city council with approval of the appointment to be granted by the DC authorizing subcommittee. Appointing a professional to run the city would increase the likelihood that congressionally mandated cuts and reforms would be instituted. A city manager would professionalize the district's government, improving the delivery of services and quality, quality of life for residents. Presently elected officials in D.C. address only short-term political problems without regard for long-term financial planning. Today we're hearing about the problems that were created perhaps in previous administrations. So it always seems to be short-term, and, and with the changing of the guard, that could go on forever. This must change. The concept of a city manager would be consistent with Representative Norton's Fiscal and Management Oversight Board, or the Emergency Oversight Board, and whatever we choose to call it. My colleague, uh, Mr. Dixon, earlier had a word to describe some of the problems in the management, mid-management levels, and I think the word was malaise, that uh, sometimes uh, it, it, perhaps a city manager system could address and, and streamline some of these operations without political fears and knowing that the city manager is employed long term, uh, transcending administrations, a mayoral administrations that come and go, and uh, it has worked in communities. So I'll continue to study this effort and uh, also the Kemp and Norton plans and I urge my colleagues to do the same. I'd like to ask the mayor if I could first of all, uh, what is your opinion of the city manager uh, municipal government? Congressman, uh, I think that's an area that whatever oversight, uh, however you want to call this board, ought to look at. Uh, obviously, there are plus and minuses for it. Uh, we have a city administrator form of government with the mayor at the top of it here. Richmond has city manager. Most of California has city manager. I'd like to look at it and see whether or not it would be more applicable for D.C. than not. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I know a number of city managers. Uh, Mr. Rogers, who I hired as my first city administrator, came from a city manager form of government. Uh, and they, too, had their, their budget difficulties when there's an uh, inadequate revenue base. I think, Congressman, until we solve this revenue base problem, either whether we can tax income at its source or some other way to broaden the D.C. government's revenue base or transfer these responsibilities, uh, I'm not sure that any form of governance will change that problem. So it's something I'd like to look at. I hadn't thought about it uh, in great detail until you just asked me about it. Well, certainly acknowledging the fact that all forms of municipal governments will have uh, financial problems, 
uh, I would venture to say that the, the, the ones that have city managers, uh, the city manager form of government, uh, have had fewer may have less may margins have. of problems compared to the, the, the huge disaster that's on the horizon now uh, that the District of Columbia is facing. I also would uh, ask, uh, uh, and, and following up on some remarks that my, uh, our Chairman Walsh made earlier, it was, and Delegate Norton, it was very difficult uh, to pass the appropriations uh, com uh, bill last time around. And it is going to be even more difficult this time around. I would urge you, Mayor, and uh, all of the folks that you can mobilize uh, within the District of Columbia's uh, st governmental structure to, to send a strong message as quickly as you possibly can that, you, that the district is ready to get its house in order. Because if that message isn't clear, it's going to be difficult to pass any bill, uh, e even, if, even if every member sitting up here is for it. And I voted for the bill last year. Uh, it's going to be ten times more so this time around. So I would urge all of you to help us in the, with, the, with the perception problem, the real problem, uh, and the, the image the city uh, has had for too long now, and, and send a strong message that you're ready to change direction. Congressman, I uh, understand the perception problem and the reality problem that would make it difficult. I mean, I think that the D.C. government has not been as forthcoming as it ought to be with information about its budget, uh, has not been perceived as an efficient, effective uh, instrument of, of government, uh, and has not always uh, told the story in a way that makes people understand why they ought to be supportive. And I intend to do everything I can to, first of all, be forthcoming in whatever I know about this situation and the others. And two, to, to get our government, we started on the road to be in a much more responsive and responsible government. A number of our citizens are frustrated uh, at the uh, D.C. government, but I think we started that notwithstanding our political, I mean, our financial situation. For instance, something as simple as answering the telephone in a very courteous, responsive way. We've tackled that problem by training over 1,500 people in the last month, merely how to say, may I help you? Uh, my name is Marion Barry. They're doing that. That's just a simple area, but there are much larger ones of uh, the government has not been as responsive as it ought to be. So you're finding me, a mayor that's going to insist that we be more responsive. And, and as we become more responsive, I think members of the Congress will see that. And as we solve this budget problem in Congress, we're going to solve this problem. And no one in this room uh, is uh, uh, going to preside over the demise of the D.C. government or the, or the nation's capital. We're going to solve it. The question is how we solve it. We're going to solve it. I know my time is up, but just in my closing comment is uh, you being a member of the majority party here now, we've got a lot of tough battles we're going to have, but there may not be one tougher <laughs> than passing the appropriations bill for the District of Columbia. But also we need all, all the help we can get. Our nation's capital has to be among the highest priority. We cannot preside over the demise of our capital. I agree with you. I yield back, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Goodnick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would start by saying I am not a fault finder, and I know that there are people uh, who look for fault like there's a reward for it, but I, I don't happen to be one of them. I do happen to, however, believe in uh, the whole idea of, of actions and consequences, and I was curious, and, and perhaps first maybe I should state uh, part of my education process has been to uh, uh, reread as much as I can of the uh, Home Rule Act, and, and I would encourage members on both sides of, of this desk here to at least uh, read or reread what the responsibilities are of the city council, uh, the mayor's office, particularly as it relates to the financial duties of the mayor, as well as the authority and the responsibilities of the members of Congress. It's, it's been interesting reading for me. But, but I want to get to a point here, and, and you just, uh, Mr. Mayor, sort of recited a list of departments and department heads that overspent their budget last year. I'm just curious, what was the consequence to those department heads? I mean, are they still all employed? Did they get uh, pay raises? Did they get a bonus last year? I mean, there has to be a consequence for, for what some would describe as mismanagement. Are they all still on the payroll? Some are, some are not. <clears throat> I'll give an example of something, Congressman, that is not the fault of any manager. Uh, take an area of settlement in judges. This is a line where when citizens sue the D.C. government, they get awards from judges or jurors, or et cetera. 
That line overspent by six million five eighty nine. That wasn't a management problem, it was a budget problem. It was under budgeted in the first place. It seems to me there has to be a different kind of budgeting system which says that we don't know what settlement judges are going to be. We can sort of predict what they were last year, but somebody gets a five million dollar settlement because somebody uh, didn't sow somebody that right at DC General. That's not a manager's problem. Or human services, seventy million dollars because of the Medicaid over, over, over under budgeted. That's not a management problem. I suspect though that in public works, uh, the, that person is gone. I just tell you that now. Uh, human services person is gone. Uh, fire still here. Police still here. But take police retirement, seven million dollars. That's not a management problem. The police retirement fund was underfunded, under budgeted. Uh, Disability compensation. This is the area where our workers who get hurt uh, can draw disability on a partial basis for as uh, long as they are certified by a doctor to be injured. That overspent by $3 million. That's again a budgeting problem. So with the two or three areas where, in my view, there are management problems, uh, two of those uh, three people are gone. Right now, uh, uh, I can't speak for the past administration. But my attitude is that once we agree on a budget for an agency, and it's a real budget, not some false accounting kind of budget, I expect those managers to live within their budget, or they won't be a part of my administration. Well, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Mayor, I, I, again, I'm not, uh, I'm not really trying to pick on anybody, but, but I think uh, my grandmother used to say, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. That's right. I agree. And, and uh, to echo what Mr. Bonilla said just a few minutes ago, probably the toughest job is going to be for some of us freshmen over here uh, to go to our colleagues in the freshman class and say that we, we uh, need some kind of an additional appropriation for the city of Washington, D.C., because we're going to have to convince them uh, that everything is being done that's possible uh, to set a long-term strategy so that this isn't, this isn't going to be something that's going to happen every year. We're going to call it a budget problem rather than a management problem. And uh, so we've got a difficult task. And, and the old uh, spiritual says, if you would be convincing, you've got to be convinced. We've got to be convinced before we can sell the rest of our colleagues. I agree with you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I'll back and convince you. We're going to do all we can to, to do what we say we're going to do and do it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walsh. I'd like to yield uh, for questions to Mr. Kingston of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayor. You have a lot of non-federally owned buildings in Washington, D.C. that do not pay property taxes. For example, many of the uh, political type groups on both sides of the aisle of different uh, ideologies and so forth have some sort of a special charter, which I understand is a federal charter, not a city charter. It, is that, um, in your opinion, a problem? Absolutely. How many buildings are businesses fall into such category? We can get that, get that to you. I don't have the uh, exact number. At this would point. it not help your situation? Would it not help your situation if we had an inventory of such businesses or groups and determined what that loss of revenue is? Because I understand in certain cities there are universities and so forth located there that don't pay property taxes, yet they are paying something similar, which although it might be not might not be 100 percent, it does help put some money in the coffers, which you so desperately need right now. Congressman Kingston, we do have a list of all of the tax exempt properties. I just don't happen to have it here with me. Uh, and we know the uh, value of that uh, property. A number of them are hospitals as well as universities, but a number of them are certainly embassies. No embassies pay taxes. Then there are other uh, international organizations that are here that don't pay taxes. But we can get that to you. But the, my answer is, is that we ought to redefine the tax relationship to the city government. The idea of property tax forgiveness is that that entity offers a service or an activity to a community in lieu of taxes. That's why you don't pay it. We have entities in Washington that get in property taxes, don't contribute hardly anything to the well-being uh, of our city. And I would like to get that list to you, and maybe we can figure out how we get to Congress to revoke if some of that. If you could get it to the committee, and including me, and break it down, I, I don't know if we could lump embassies in with universities necessarily, but there must be a number of 
things that we can take a look at and, and break it down by category. Let me move on to another question. You know, let me give you one, one example of that. I just looked in the book here. The National Geographic Society, it appears though the value of their property tax assessed value is $160 million. If we had taxed at our rate, that would be a considerable amount of money, as an example. I think that would be very interesting to look into, and I think it's something that we should look into at the time of this crisis. Now, also, your uh, employee benefit plan, your health care and retirement and so forth, how does that compare, not necessarily to Alexandria, or, but maybe to Baltimore, some of the you know, other cities about the same size as, as you, Columbus, Ohio, and so forth? Is your benefit package more generous? Is it on par? Is it less generous? This is Mr. King, our personal director. Let me just ask him. Uh, Congressman, uh, a significant uh, number of our health and life uh, programs are modeled after the federal government's plan because many of our employees come out of that federal civil service system. Mm -hmm. Those employees that are not covered by that, they're about 13,000, 14,000. Our health and life benefits are comparable to other large cities. They're, maybe they're, they're not over generous. And th would that be, that'd be the same for retirement too then? Retirements are in several categories. Uh, those employees who were on board prior to a certain date, I think it was 80, 87, are part of the Civil Service Retirement Program. And those who came in after 87 are part of the district's uh, defined uh, contribution plan. Then you have the firefighters, police officers, teachers, and judges in another plan. Uh, prior to 1980, I think the uh, firefighters and the police and judges had a very, very generous plan. And they still have a very generous plan because there are two, year, two colas a year in there and some other things in it. Uh, but our regular civil service plan is similar to the federal government. Our defined pension plan is, is very modest. It's, it's probably comparable to other local jurisdictions. Okay, let me ask you this. Now, you had mentioned a second ago about the D.C. hospital doing a $5 million award. Do you own the hospital completely? What, how is the ownership of the hospital broken down? The uh, D.C. General Hospital uh, is controlled, owned, and managed by the D.C. government. Would it be appropriate to look into spinning that off? to another entity, um, maybe because I don't know how many cities own hospitals anymore. Um, I don't know the answer, but it would appear to me that because of the likelihood of a, this $5 million malpractice um, liability being incurred, that that could happen to you again, as well as other unpleasant surprises, and maybe that should be spun off. Um, also, for example, you have a law school, is that correct? Yes, sir. Things like that, should we look at spinning them off and seeing if they can stand on their own and getting them off your balance sheet? Well, we're looking at uh, D.C. General. I agree with you. We need to, first of all, redefine the mission of our hospital because it has not been redefined in the last 20 years and demographics and medicine changes. And so we're looking at a, uh, a public, uh, public benefit corporation uh, we're looking at asking uh, 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 local hospitals, they want to help, uh, want to manage the hospital. We're looking at a combination of our health clinics and the hospital and another hospital coming together. But we're clearly going to change the governance of the hospital. The president's mission is too broad. Besides Congressman, the hospital is draining the city government uh, out of over $32 million last year that we that went on the budget. And so I would say by... Uh, the end of this year, we ought to have a model for the hospital, both governance and, and financially. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know I'm out of time. Can I? And the law school uh, was controversial okay. about that, but I just state my position. We're going to submit over to the, to the council uh, in March 
proposal to close the D.C. law school um, starting October 1st. Okay, just one last question. Uh, getting back to the list of the buildings that aren't paying property tax, when could I get that list from you and who in your office will be given, handling that? Ms. Lorraine Britton is our Director of uh, Finance and Revenue. We would all like that, and I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Tomorrow morning, okay. we, we have a list. Thank you very much. And we have the assessed value of it and the taxes that would be foregone because of the fact it's tax exempt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. I assume you don't want to include the uh, federally owned property, just non right. federally owned or controlled property where there's a tax situation to it. Correct. Yes, sir. No, thank you. I, I feel that we will look at that and work with you on that. Thank uh, you. Appreciate you bringing that. We in. have a larger problem now. You know, we have some entities in town that the council is going to have hearings on tomorrow. One of them is Fannie Mae, that has huge holdings and don't pay any corporate uh, income tax. We want. We want. We want to. We want to look at the property tax side, though. I think was the the question here. I think uh, <laughs> they do pay property, and uh, we'll be happy to look at anything else you send up as well. Right. Uh, gentleman from uh, Ohio, Mr. Latourette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and. Uh, Mr. Clark, I need to apologize to you for not being present during testimony. I was visited by our mayor, Mayor Michael White, from the city of Cleveland. And uh, Mayor Barry, I'd tell you that uh, there's good hope and that uh, the, the mayor of the city of Cleveland, who presided over our city at the time of default, has just been elected to our highest Senate. So anything is possible in these times of financial crisis. <laughs> I, uh, Mr. Clark, I, I do want to I, I focus Congress. on you. <laughs> I want to focus on, on you for a minute because I, I've heard Mayor Barry repeatedly say that he's uh, been in office for a month and a half or a month and 21 days. And um, uh, One of your council members was kind enough to give me the McKinsey report yesterday, and so I had last night who made good bedside reading, and in particular page 9 of the report, which the mayor has referenced and, and placed in, uh, in the record of this particular committee, um, indicates that, that, that this independent agency recommended, uh, and I, I found the words rather prophetic, that the district... Uh, uh, take some rational steps now, and now being based upon the date of the report, October of 1994, in a non-crisis atmosphere to head off more draconian steps that would otherwise be uh, be required. And uh, some of the the programs or some of the directions, although they were non-specific, that they asked the district to look at uh, was a, a consideration of uh, reducing per recipient Medicaid spending by seven percent, uh, which would bring it down to uh, levels presently expended in the state of Maryland. Also, uh, uh, launching programs to reduce per pupil expenditures by 8%, which would bring it in line with Montgomery County educational standards. Uh, the, the sum and substance of this particular uh, document seems to be that, and I think it's been stressed here today in, in this committee hearing, and, and uh, I appreciate, appreciate all of the witnesses and all of the testimony, so it seems to be that this is, needs to be a two-way street, um, but even the consultant hired by the district suggests that the first step of the journey needs to be made by the district to restore uh, perhaps some credibility with, with the United States Congress uh, if the Congress is then asked to, to meet, meet the, uh, the district halfway on that trip. And, and my question is, uh, since the uh, McKinsey folks used words like uh, uh, taken now, should be done immediately, uh, my question is what, what steps were discussed and, and uh, necessarily taken back in October, November, and December uh, of 1994 relative to this um, impending crisis uh, prior to the mayor's arrival then in, in the month of January. And, and specifically, uh, did, did the council uh, get together and launch upon a program of reform that would uh, bring the, the expenditures for Medicaid uh, down to a level more in accordance with Maryland uh, and educational spending more in accordance with the levels being spent in Montgomery County? Yes, we did. Yeah. Yes, we did, Congressman. Uh, we did. Uh, take a cut to the Medicaid budget premised upon uh, the, change, the change in the options. And we did pattern that uh, along the case of Maryland. As a matter of fact, we got the list of, of what did Maryland, Virginia, and the District of Columbia have, and we went for only those, uh, to leave only those that we all three had. So uh, if we stood uh, with the company of one of them, we cut, we cut that option. Now, that was in the budget. It still has to be uh, gone through. The implementation process, that's part of what we're, we are watching. But yes, we did do that. Okay. What, what about the, as to the issue of the uh, educational spending, the school district? The educational spending, yes, we've taken many, many looks at it, uh, Congressman. As I said earlier, may, maybe I think to the, uh, your, your neighbor, your right there, Congressman from uh, Minnesota, 
<clears throat> we only uh, we only budget the bottom line expenditure of the schools. That is in the charter written by the Congress. We cannot go to the line items of the schools. It is a matter of intensive frustration. We have found expenditures in the schools that we simply do not like. Um, travel and conferences is one of them that I've focused upon. Um, and I could fuss, I could fume, I could do other things that begin with F, but I, I could not do anything about it because all I could do is write a memo, uh, uh, file a report, uh, say cut the bottom line based upon if they cut back that expenditure, they could save the money other than applying it to a classroom. And we have done that kind of thing. In fact, we did cut. $31 million from the school's overline, uh, overall budget, premising $14 million on, on furloughs if they wanted to take them, and also premising uh, the remainder on uh, things that we identified in a report that could be done in the schools uh, to save those monies. We did not, however, have the line item authority to enforce that, and certainly in any restructural examinations that anybody might make, uh, getting more responsibility uh, um, on the uh, part of those who have now only the authority to spend, no responsibility to raise uh, the monies uh, would be helpful or give us the capability to do line item examinations and, and budgeting. It, it sounds like line item veto is something that you're in favor yes. of, is that right? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Yield back, Mr. Thank Chair. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let the Chair start the second um, round of uh, questions if I, if I can. Um, cash payments right now to some of the vendors, uh, Mr. Mayor, I think you had said you're trying to pay things within 30 days after getting logged in. Is that approximately correct or ask whoever can answer that? The, uh, the law allows 45 days. Uh, we, we're just trying to catch up okay. uh, with some of these payments uh, go back uh, to June and July of last year, over $5 million in human services alone last summer. Our present policy right now is to try to do it in 30 days. Um, depending on our cash flow, we may move back to 45 days. Okay. But the big problem we have is to make sure that when these obligations are made and the products are delivered, that the agencies enter those into their right. system so it then hits our central system. Okay. And we have tightened up on that. I've said to uh, our, eight, our managers that uh, they have to do this, otherwise they'll be doing something right. else. Now that is not an information technology problem entering into the system. That, that's a management problem, right? People problem. Yeah, management problem, just to make sure that gets... Which, on, since January 2nd, though, we don't, we don't have that problem in terms of people. Every, every agency of government now right. knows. And as I said earlier, Mr. Hawkins went on January 2nd and un uncovered in about seven or eight days almost $20 million of Right. Obligations that not been entered into the system. I've only got five minutes. I want to move quickly and try. I'll, to I'll make. I keep my answer short okay. too. Okay. Um, Federal Bureau of Prisons. What, what do we owe them now? It's 12 million. Is it the first of January? Uh, any idea? Ballpark. 5.4 million. Okay. They bill us quarterly. We I, mean, uh, I know. Just ballpark. I'm <laughs> trying to get it. Uh, on uh, Metro. I know. On February 17th. Uh, Larry Reuters wrote uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, stating that the district's $18.3 million in arrears, including interest and payments to Metro, uh, this is causing serious cash flow problems for the uh, Transit Authority. Um, he listed several actions the district needs to take in order to avert a termination of Metro bus service in the district as of April 1st. Um, you know how you're going to respond to this letter at this point? They're going to check tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, now, have you provided assurances that the district will support the $5.2 million in district service and fare changes which were approved by the City Council on December 21st? Do I support that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Council passed it. Answers yes. Okay. Do you, how about the past due school subsidy amount of $2.8 million? That's important. That's in the 5.2. Okay. I don't support, let me just say, Mr. Chairman, and I've said this to uh, the mayor's representative on the uh, board and to Mr. Evans, who's a council representative, that our representatives should have insisted on an overall metro budget reduction when it was known last year the city was not going to contribute with so much money to that pot. And so this year around, certainly my representative will accurately represent how much the city intends to contribute so that metro itself 
can be cut. I think Metro needs to be trimmed. I support the regional authority, and you do too, but it needs to be trimmed itself. Okay, I, I, that's, that's refreshing, and it makes me feel comfortable to hear that, because as you know, for the last several years, uh, payments have constantly been in arrears, and at this point have been stacked up, uh, I think, more than at any time in the uh, authorities' uh, uh, history. You've heard discussions, and you spoke briefly today about the concept um, of, the, of a control board coming over on a temporary basis for the city to start uh, giving Congress or wh whoever the authority uh, that, that we bring that budget into line. Can you share your feelings about the, what circumstances you feel you could support this or oppose this or uh, just kind of sketch? Mr. Chairman, uh, as I said earlier, I've been in office one, my 21 days. I've done nothing. Uh, my administration is not overspent, is not, not kept its word, has not done all the things we've been talking about all day today about uh, the D.C. government. There's no justification for me as a new mayor here to suggest any kind of control board. But the history and the structure of the district suggests one. Uh, we've had these structural relationships. We've had uh, credibility problems about our budget. Uh, we're asking the Congress to, to uh, do its share of $267 million. And uh, if everything is going to be put on the table, both the structural relationships of uh, what ought to be the legitimate role of the federal government and the district government, whether or not we ought to have a reciprocal income tax or not, as well as investments in our infrastructure for uh, financial management, as well as a way of getting us uh, some additional revenues, uh, I would be for the Congress mandating such a board with an understanding that it's a, uh, a helping situation. It's not it's some... It's a first step towards resolving uh, a number of... Trying so that we, we can come back... Uh, next year, not having to sit at this table talking about these structural, we still may talk about them, but we have some solutions to them, and not be in a budget crisis. Uh, under those conditions, if everything's on the table, uh, and up from consideration for the people to make recommendations to the Congress on what they ought to do, I'll be for it. But okay. I would not be for one whose mere task was to take the existing money we have and tell us how to spend it. Right. The, the, I think the problem comes in because we're taking money that you don't have that you're getting from the Congress right. and want to uh, tell you. But as we've indicated you before... My position now is that I, if it's all, everything on the table, as I said yesterday, right. uh, we could be supported. I want to be in the room when this is discussed. I don't want to be outside the room throwing uh, sticks at it. Sure. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Uh, let me just ask Chairman Clark just a, a quick question. Going back to the auditor's report on November 22nd and to place the city's cash flow difficulties in a, a multi-million uh, uh, dollar range, I think about $500 million. Can you go again and tell us what the specific actions the council took uh, to save uh, that money? And uh, I, I understand the actions on December 21 uh, that there was new spending was authorized at that meeting, too, and if you could give us the context for that. Yes, yes sir. Uh, on December the 21st, we analyzed the problem as being 200, 400 and, uh, Forty-seven million dollars. That was consistent with what the uh, mayor had uh, seen it as being on December 12th. Uh, in between that time, uh, the calculated rate, uh, an act, uh, a, a rate of property taxation uh, provided for by congressional act on an automatic basis, went into effect on December 15th. And so the revenue estimates changed, and that's what accorded the difference between the 447 and the. Uh, 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 492 that we were talking in uh, in uh, uh, New York about. Um, we uh, went through the budget. We cut uh, on in allocated cuts 279.6 million dollars. Uh, we provided for uh, revenue increases of uh, <coughs> 41.5 million dollars for. Uh, and there was a mayor's pending revenue red, le, le, legislation was $3.5 million. So total revenue increases for $45 uh, million. That was not including that calculated property tax rate that I had spoken of. So we saw uh, a, a capability of $321.6 million to address to what we had identified as being uh, a number of the problems uh, in the city. And that's a little bit of what I addressed earlier when I spoke of the conversation at staff level between my staff and the congressional staff about the use of monies for addressing problems. The first thing that we did 
was provide that $140 million would be budgeted as set aside for the $140 million that you told us uh, to uh, not spend for anything, to cut from our expenditures. We also budgeted the $79 million, which I spoke about before uh, when I had the opportunity. We budgeted $10.1 million for a problem that we saw with Metro, and you just addressed some of that problem, Congressman. We, about, uh, we provided $58 million uh, for what had been, at that point, discovered to be the Medicaid problem, $11 million for DPW, uh, that's the Department of Public Works, uh, $10 million for uh, the hospital, and $10 million for the police department, all to under-budgeted uh, uh, problems that we had seen uh, previously there, too. Um, and uh, that's, that's what we did. Okay. Uh, th th thank you. That answers my uh, question. Okay. Uh, Chairman Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mayor Barry, when uh, Congressman Gutnick made the point that uh, uh, someone should be held accountable for these decisions, you're, you made the point that uh, uh, really what we have here is revenue problems, not management problems. Uh, and yet, consistently, the Medicaid budget has been underfunded, not just in the Kelly administration, but in yours. There are five deficits recorded in the eight years of your administration in Medicaid. Not as large as the Kelly administration, but deficits nonetheless. Um, overtime has been severely under budgeted. Um, revenues have been overestimated. Uh, in fact, revenues uh, in, the, in the last, according to GAO, revenues, uh, local revenues, have grown by 13% uh, since 1989, and spending has outpaced that by 5%. So is it revenues or is it spending that's the problem? And if it's spending, is it management? Chairman, it's a combination of all of that. Uh, if you take the uh, Medicaid budget, it's a matter of both under budgeted and management. The audit contracts for 1991, 92, 93, 94, was a management decision not to do them. I didn't make it, but uh, there were no audits done. In there were no, uh, there were no audits. Wait a minute, let me make of sure. Medicaid. The 92 and 93 audits were not started in the 94 under the previous administration. That was a management decision. It shouldn't have been made. So, so what you're saying is there are no audits in 92 and 93? They're now been done. They are now, but I'm saying that prior to uh, the latter part of 94, there were no audits of 92 and 93 because someone made the decision not to sign the management, I mean, not to sign the audit contract. That was a management decision. Well, let me ask a question about that, if I may, since you brought up Medicaid. Uh, the $103 million Medicaid accrual that was made in fiscal year 1994 is said to be due to unaudited Medicaid costs uh, from 92 and 93. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Can I explain it? Sure. Uh, what happens in the Medicaid program, there is something called payments in progress. So as a as a provider sends the district their bill for, say, Bob Pullman being in the hospital, the district pays what's called a payment in progress. The payment in progress is usually less than the cost that the provider said it wants. Then the district government has an auditor to go down and sit with Ms. Smith and company to see whether or not what she charged, because we're a reasonable cost state, is reasonable. And you make the adjustments, you make the settlements. And so the $103 million represent the years of 92, 93, uh, and 94, where the cost reports had been sent in, but the audits had not been done. Well, Once the audits are done, there will be a settlement with the providers for the years that they had the cost reports, 92, 93, 94. Coopers and Librand billed the district for over a half a million dollars for auditing uh, Medicaid in those two years. Is that not true? Mr. Chairman, uh, 
is a prior year audit. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going on what I have. As I said, it's a management problem. They should have been, somebody should have been hired to do these audits. Well, if they, if they audit it, then we should know that. If they didn't, they shouldn't have been paid. It's my understanding, Mr. Chairman, that they were auditing prior years to 91. It, uh, we're talking about 92 and 93. Yeah. Right. The other part of it, come on, come on. I understand that Bert Smith Mr. Nunn ought to come up here and explain this, because I don't, I don't want to do this. Well, uh, uh, we're going to have Cooper's Library in on Friday. I'd well, I think it's important we try to at least get just a minute of, of how that happened so I can... All right, fine. Do you have any objection to that, Mr. Chairman? No, no, no. Fine. I'm not doing... Right. Well, Mr. That. Chairman, I think that Mr. Nunn should testify here and be sworn if he, in fact, is going to testify. I'd be happy to swear you. Raise your hand. with the job. Please uh, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear a testimony. You're about to give the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Nunn, the question was uh, that I posed to, to the mayor. Uh, were, uh, the mayor began by saying that there were no audits of Medicaid 91, 92, 93, and then I believe stood corrected and said that there were audits. Could you tell us specifically if uh, Medicaid was audited in 19, for the fiscal years 1992 and 1993? Individual audits, which are auditing of the cost reports at each of the individual providers, which are hospitals, nursing homes, and the like. Uh, the contracts for the 92 and 93 uh, audits were let in early 94, and an effort was made during the year 94. All of 92 were done, 93 are substantially done, uh, and they're working on the final numbers. So, so that in, in fact, they are in the process of being audited. The audit, audits have not been yet completed. That's correct. And 90, 94 cost reports, of course, are just being submitted uh, at current time. Some, are, some hospitals, based on what their year end is, have turned in their cost reports. Others are yet due to the district. And there are estimates for the amount of their cost reports included in the accrual at the end of the end of the 1994 fiscal year. All right, then perhaps uh, you can clarify something that uh, was, was attributed to you in the paper. It says, in announcing the $103 million deficit, and this is, comes from the mayor's uh, 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 statement of the district's finances, its indebtedness, or debt, rather. In announcing the $103 million deficit, very officials attributed that sum largely to the Kelly administration's failure to conduct Medicaid audits for 92 and 93. But unresolved bills from that year account for only $4 million of the problem, according to Peter Nunn, a partner in Coopers & Librand, the accounting company that recently analyzed the city's overall finances. Could you tell us how you get from $4 million to $103 million? Uh, let me describe that for you. Uh, the district throughout the year records the cash payments, which are normally referred to as PIPs, the partial payments to the various providers. In addition, they record the payments for any settlements of prior years, and they s finally closed and settled years prior to 1990 in the current year. In At the current year, meaning fiscal year 95? Four. I'm Thanks. sorry, 94. At the end of 94, in the normal closing process for the district of their financial statements, they accumulate the information relating to all the amounts that are, that are due but unpaid. That number is referred to the Medicaid accrual. At the end of 1994, the accounting department for DHS would normally collect the information together and prepare that accrual. As of early January, 
the accounting department for DHS had not collected that information together to make the entries that make complete the accrual accounting for the financial statements. Working with them, the accounting department, auditors from Cooper's Librand and Bert Smith accumulated the information and the came to the total amount due to all providers for all open years, which includes 90 through 94. So this goes back to 1990. That's, in ter that's the amounts that are due. The sum of that, sum of that amount is equivalent to $261 million. That's the gross amount. Upon payment, there will be a reimbursement for half of that under the Medicaid program. At the beginning, 260 million. 261 million. It yes. is owing to whom? The to the providers? Health care providers in the district. Hospitals, nursing homes, and, and ICMMRs. Can you tell us how much of this uh, is attributable to uh, the year 1990 and 91? Uh, because those would have been incurred in 89 and 90, would they not? Let me finish the story, right. and I think you'll All see right. the answer. Right. At the end of 1991 or 94, the accrual totaled 261 million. Beginning of the year, the accrual total, totaled 54 million. What year? Beginning of the 94 fiscal year, uh, October 23, right. which is recorded was 207 million. At the same time, there's a cruel for the receivable for the program. Therefore, the net cost to the district for that change is 103 million. Yeah. That's half of it. That 103 million, using that as the, as, as the reference, Reported on the cost on those cost, cost reports which had not been received. Also, in the year 1994, there were regulatory or rule changes. Two of them that I can best describe to you are the state plan, which is the plan that determines how the Medicaid program works had changes that were approved final in 1994 that are, were retroactive to 1990. Our belief is, on the, looking at the documents, that out of the 103, 33 million represented changes, though they related to prior years, were determined in 1994 only after the State program was state plan was approved. In addition, estimating process, we believe there were another four million dollars of just differences in estimates because better information was known. So the sum of those three numbers, 66, 4, and 33, give you the 103 million, which is discussed everywhere. Thank you for taking us on that journey. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like my time has run out, but sure, I'm just, uh, uh, <laughs> I'll stay with it if you will, Mayor. Okay, there's a chart we'd like to uh, submit to you that indicates just for FY94 alone, these are services provided in 94, and the payment in progress went to the providers, and the cost reports came, indicates, and Peter helped me with this, that in 94 alone, we were talking about an accrual of $207 million. Is that accurate? That's the increase in the accrual. Increase in the accrual. Prior to 94, the accrual was $54,289,000. Also, the way you count this Medicaid is the year in which the service is provided. So in FY90 would be the years provided, 91, 92, 94. So you see that from a management point of view, these audits contracts should have been signed earlier and they should have been done. 
uh, is similar to 95. As we get into 95, my view would be that an audit contract ought to be in the place to very soon start auditing 95 so we can reconcile the payments in progress with the cost reports and audit report so we don't have this big lag. The hospital sued the District of Columbia government in 1993 for their payments in 92, 93. You can see why when you have these big numbers out there, somebody's carrying his costs. Well, uh, let me just wrap up then uh, because I've far exceeded my time and I thank Mr. Nunn for coming on uh, quickly uh, to respond. Uh, Mr. Nunn, by saying that um, there, there are a lot of here on Medicaid and I just uh, uh, wonder, I don't wonder, I know the Congress is not going to be willing to come up with with any dollar figure to pay for Medicaid or anything else uh, because they aren't solid numbers. They shift constantly. And uh, before uh, we entertain any uh, action by the Congress, um, we need to know, Mayor, you said early on, you know how much cash you got, you know how many bills you owe. Can you tell us right now? Congressman, in terms of the Medicaid problem, it will not be difficult for the GAO auditors. The whole budget. I'm going to get to that in a few seconds. The general accounting officers, the D.C. government, and the auditors to figure out a real number of how much cash is needed for 95 and how much of this is accrual. That's not hard to do, just a question of going through all the cost reports and making a decision. In terms of the D.C. government, uh, as of uh, yesterday, indicated earlier, we have investments of 300 and Uh, we had outstanding checks of
that it's not relevant to anything. Hundred million dollars, then you ask, is it okay if what is your intent with this twenty the twenty million dollars isn't there? Congressman, Explain it to him. Maybe I uh, missed the point. All right, Congressman. Uh, I don't know whether you did or not, but my point was not to, 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 to do what I think you're saying I'm trying to do. My point was to ask how that was operative when we have an under-budgeting problem. And there were monies that we put into the budget recognizing that. And then this restriction went into place. And I was asking what the directions of the Congress was, because I intend to have the City Council follow this body's directions. And it was a point of, of notice of, um, of matter of concern we've had. And I'm sorry I've raised it if it caused consternation. But we're well, we're trying to abide by what you've let me instructed tell you why us to it do. Does with me. Because the conversations at these his hearings historically, except for maybe today, get way off the track. Get way off the track. And all I'm suggesting is for you to say now, what is your intent about this $20 million when everyone seems to agree you're going to be $700 million in the hole? What difference does it make? I mean, literally, what difference does it make? Obedience to your law, sir. That's all. That's what we were trying to do. That's the difference it makes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I just pursue a couple of things uh, here? Uh, I noticed that Mr. Nunn was here, and I know that we're going to have a, a hearing with uh, Coopers. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Nunn, could, could you just come forward just one more time on some of these issues? Mr. Nunn, I, I realize that we're going to have a, um, uh, a hearing that will involve uh, Coopers and Lyburn uh, on Friday, but I just wanted to ask you a couple of preliminary questions, if I could. As I understand it, Mr. Nunn, you are the, the managing partners of Coopers and Lyburn in the Washington office. That would be my desire, sir, but I am the audit partner. On the, <laughs> okay. On the, Very good. On the audit of the District of Columbia, yes. Okay. Now, if you could just explain to me what that means. I mean, what direct control do you have over the audits made by the district, uh, by Coopers and Lyburn for the district? As the partner in charge of the engagement, along with George Wiley from Burt Smith and Company, who together we perform the audit. We have control over the audit plan, audit process, uh, and the audit, auditing tests, and the opinion which is included in the, the CAFR. The financial statements, as it says in the front of the, of the uh, document, are the responsibility of the district and the district controller. We are in a position of either giving an opinion that the statements conform to generally accepted accounting principles or that they do not. Right. Now, I want to ask you about a couple of things. Uh, uh, did you give an opinion in, in your 1994 audit? Yes, we did. And what was that opinion? It's an unqualified opinion, which means we believe... Yeah, explain that to me. We believe the financial statements based on our audit of the financial records, were in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles that they included the appropriate disclosures. Right. Yeah, I, I'm not an accountant or auditor. You will find that out by my questions. So then, generally you would say that uh, your audit could not reflect the financial condition of an entity and in particular the District of Columbia. In other words, looking at your audit and your opinion would not tell you whether the patient was well, slipping in health, or dead. It would just say that uh, all these numbers uh, seem to add up and uh, there is some documentation from it. The reason I say that is because we've been wondering 
or I've been wondering if you look at the mayor's letter, he opens up by saying there's a financial crisis. Uh, your, your letter doesn't say anything about any crisis at any time. And, and I, as I hear you, and I'll give you an opportunity to respond, generally you're saying, well, that's not the purpose of it. it, it, it. And so I'm asking, should your letter, should a lay person be able to pick it up and tell if there are any problems with the district? I think our letter has, as it says, has to be read in conjunction with reading the financial statements. I believe they clearly point out the results of operations for the year, the fact that there is an excess of liabilities over assets in the current fund and the general fund, uh, that the general fund had a loss of approximately $335 million for the year. That type of information, and the when you read yeah. through the footnotes, but that's in the that's in the financial statement. That's correct. Yeah. Well, then explain to me, and I, I'm really trying to get information for the hearing on Thursday. What is the purpose of the letter? I mean, uh, if if the audit speaks for itself, how does the letter enhance it or detract from the audit statement? Why why the letter? It, it says, as an independent person, separate from the organization that prepared the financial statements, that Having reviewed the documentation, performed appropriate audit tests, that the financial statements are in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Okay. Now, how long have you had this capacity with the district? The district district puts out a contract for auditors for a four-year period. Uh, this is the third year of the four-year period. Uh, and following completion of the four-year period, we're not permitted to uh, follow ourselves. Okay, and then you, then you either prepared or were aware of a letter of January 11th, 1994, that I asked them about at a subsequent hearing, where I think the thrust of it, it's signed by Coopers and Lyburn, that uh, you tell them that uh, you've conducted an audit and that the 1993 financial statements reflect an account, an amount currently due to the District of Columbia of $58 million. This deals with the hospital. Does that ring any bells with you? Yes, that's in the 93. Right. Now, they started on, on this path in 1990 in writing off uh, 9 million something, and then it increased to 58 million, and then in the last year is another. 21 or something, and it jumped up to about 80. Is that just generally correct? That's generally right. correct, yes. What, and you probably noticed this uh, uh, asset in the first year. That's correct. Yeah. And what is it that changed your mind about it? To, to write them in 94 saying, well, you've got to start writing this thing down, if I understand the letter. I mean, what facts had changed? As I, let me first, let me ask you, did you understand the circumstances surrounding, uh, surrounding this um, loan to the general hospital that was carried as an asset? Yes. Okay. Then what, what changed to make you say we better start writing this thing off? I mean, you understood that it was an entity that was owned and operated by the district, that they had a legal responsibility for it, that they had appropriated money, and the money that was loaned to them was the difference between the appropriated money and the actual money spent, and you thought it was proper to call it a loan. And then I'm asking you, then what happened that made you change your mind or say you better start writing this thing down? Yes, I understand. Uh, as you know, it started in 1990. It goes on for a number of years. Yeah. In the beginning, in the initial years, uh, there was some discussion. In 1992, for instance, in our management letter, we pointed out to them that that, that item probably should be expensed if they were not going to develop a plan for repayment. Uh, at that same time, we did not, while we mentioned it in the management letter, we did not think it was sufficient to uh, direct, insist on its write-off in 1992. During 1993, that continued to grow. It is in accordance with general accepted accounting principles that is a pro it is possible to have loans 
between different funds and that in the circumstances where you where you have uh, our, and develop a plan for elimination and reduction of that loan is appropriate to continue to carry it until it's repaid at the during the and at the end of 93 with legislation that took effect on October 1, 1994, or ni right. uh, ni uh, the beginning of the, the current year, yeah. uh, <clears throat> the management or the oversight of the hospital, which had been invested in the board, was removed from the board, but back directly under the control of the mayor with a directive that the mayor establish a plan for uh, reducing the deficit at the hospital and seeing to it that it was, it was re uh, repaid and eliminated over a five-year period. Uh, it was our belief that under accounting rules that, that, that having worked out or set out on a program to establish that plan, we would give them more time. Uh, the, this district retained the assistance of a consultant in that particular area. They submitted their report sometime in January of 1994, or maybe February. Uh, the mayor at that time submitted a plan in approximately June with a, with a description of how they were going to uh, make changes to the hospital. Uh, as I got to reviewing the documents at the end of 90, fiscal 94 and on into the end of the year, Having mentioned it in advance, if there was not progress towards that, uh, we would no longer uh, go along with carrying that as a loan. It became clear to me there was not progress being made. Therefore, I recommended to the city that they write, set up a reserve to cover that amount. The result, uh, Mayor Barry did, in fact, do that. That is correct. Right. It's reflected in the 94 statements. If I could, Mr. Chairman, I just want to pursue this one issue. Now, you went through with me the things that were done after 1993 about the mayor getting some consultants and, and doing all of those things and submitting a plan. But what was it in 1990 that made you think that this was a loan and that there was a scheme to repay? You see, on the tail end, we did start making it look like we're doing something. In fact, Mayor Kelly came and testified that she had hopes that, um, that when it became a public-private corporation, that they would be able to pay back this money. And then someone even suggested that maybe the, that this uh, hospital authority could um, float some bonds to, to pay off this loan to the city. But what was it in 90 that made you think that this was a, I mean, you realize this was all the same people, right? Uh, It'd be like me loaning uh, myself some money. What was it then in, that, in, did you ask them questions about it then? In, in, I was not the auditor in 90 or 91, so there was two years of experience of that. I became the auditor in 1992. We did raise that question in both discussions and through the management letter as to whether that was appropriate. So are you saying you weren't or Cooper's was not? Cooper's was not, oh, were not then, the auditors then. in 90 or 91. <clears throat> so then uh, if I wanted to pursue this, we should go back to the, uh, to the people at that point in time. If you're considering 90 and 91, yes, I'd say you right. would have to. Well, what was it in 92 when you took in, over? In 1992. Right. This, uh, it, Ms. Kelly pursued this by way of a consultant, it's my recollection, at the beginning of 93. That's that, correct. Right. In now, what was it when you took over, in, you looked at this loan, and what in, was it that made you think it was, in fact, a loan? We and, and had a repayment plan. She hadn't done anything yet. We questioned whether it should be uh, as a loan and or as written off. However, in considering overall materiality and its effect on the financial statements, we concluded we would not either change our opinion or 
to insist that they had to write it off because of its size at that point, as opposed to having an actual plan. We did recommend that they have it. Well, it wouldn't have changed your opinion, but in fact they would have shown a deficit in those years, wouldn't they have? Or were they running a surplus on paper? Uh, 92 was a very small gain, I believe. Right. That's and, correct. And in 92 it was uh, 20 some odd million dollars? 92 yeah. is about two million. Yeah, uh, Mr. Marconi points out that they showed a plus 1.9. That's right. Well, if they owed 20 million, if they had an asset of 20 million dollars, it would have seemed to me that they would have shown a deficit. That wouldn't have changed your opinion? Not, not on the financial statements of the district of a whole, which runs four and five billion dollars, no. Well, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to take any more of your time, but it just seems that we're getting to a crux of a problem here that for our purposes, and you'll probably say, well, I knew this all along, these audits aren't, aren't worth much for our purposes. They may have some other value, but these audits aren't, aren't worth very much to us, are they? They get you financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, <laughs> and I have a very strong feeling that they were very helpful in getting the numbers together at the end of 94. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, you may. Sure, Mr. Uh, part of my frustration here, uh, and even when I was on the council, I, I raised questions about the, uh, the, the loan being carried away. It didn't make sense to me. And D.C. General was drowning in ink, and you expect him to pay it back. But the other problem, I think, uh, which I just put on record here, uh, and I met with Mr. Nunn and, and others yesterday, uh, it seems to me that accompanying the audit ought to be the management letter soon thereafter. And in the management letter, it seems to me, these analyses and observations ought to be pointed out. And the district received the uh, 1993 management letter in August of last year. Now, I've been promised that we get it this year by March 1st, but the management letter ought to have that kind of analysis, that kind of data uh, about it. And for instance, we looked at the accounts payable. That's how we discovered that the, the previous administration was carrying over $70 million. The accounts payable, payables had gone from 245 to 310 or something like that. I asked, well, why? And was then brought out that it was a carryover from the next year. So these management letters ought to be put in there. Otherwise, you're right, this audit is not as useful to us, to me and you, and the, to the community as it ought to be. Well, I was going to ask about the management letter, but I, I thought we'd reserve that for, for Friday's meeting. <laughs> you are intent to attend, Mr. Nunn. Is that? I will be here. Right. right. Thank you. May I ask one quick, quick question, Ms. Norton, before we get to Mr. Nunn, let me ask you, how many management letters have you uh, written during your time at Coopers and Libraries or other accounting firms? How many management letters have you had a hand in writing? Probably hundreds. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking at the, the September 1993 District of Columbia report to management, looking at the uh, number of items in this account, 142 uh, different I items pinpointed. Um, I could go through them all. I think you're familiar with it. Uh, implement verification procedures for bank deposits. Matured security should be reinvested or converted in cash. The district was losing money on those items. And it's page after page of these. To the, does that indicate a revenue problem or, or management problems with the district uh, from your professional viewpoint? As you can see in that letter, it's written to a number of agency level divided up by agency levels, and I think there are a lot of issues that the agencies have to address. Part of it's a matter of housekeeping, part of it's a matter of management. So a lot and of I, management issues. I, have, I believe, you ever, have you ever written a letter with this many? Uh, I've never letters. written one that long. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Norton? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mayor Barry and um, uh, Chairman Clark, uh, I wonder if you could clarify uh, a uh, issue that appears to have just arisen uh, between you. What accounts for the 
differences between the two branches on how deep the cuts should be that the differences that emerged uh, within the last uh, day or two? Norton, uh, I was on the council and participated in the council uh, vote on December 21st. And when you look at what the council did, they carried over a number of the personnel actions that had been recommended by Mayor Kelly and the council voted to implement in terms of easy out, early out, et cetera. Uh, there was very little cuts uh, in the council's budget in other than personal service. And so I've been trying to find areas and contracts and others to cut. Moreover, because uh, the system is not set up to give the council, I guess, instant information on how many people left the payroll, I guess we, we, we want to do it to them on a quarterly basis. Uh, I suspect some members of the council were reacting to the pressure from up here to some extent, and also they didn't see any real signs that money was being saved, and I kept saying we, we, we got these people off the payroll. So I don't think it's, it's, that, it's that much of a difference uh, as it appears. I think the council, as I do, want to see real savings uh, in a way that you can measure. And last night, a couple nights ago, the council moved on a, uh, a bill to, to uh, get the unions, I guess, to the table. I've said all along they won't come formally to the table on renegotiation. This wage decrease, and I don't think the difference is that large, quite frankly. I think it's a matter of, of the council members seeing uh, evidence that we're saving this money so we don't end up in August or September saying we thought we were going to do it and didn't do it. Uh, secondly, I get the impression that, and I was on the council for two years, that the previous administration credibility was not as good as it ought to be, and I suspect there's a sort of a carrier one whether that mine is as good. I don't know if Mr. Clark can answer that question or not. I am, Congresswoman Norton, I need a little bit of a clarification. What is the difference to which you're reference, making your reference? Uh, Mr. Clark, I only know what I read on, in, in the newspaper and, and see on the television. There appears to be a difference between you or the council and the mayor Yes. on the depth of the cuts that are needed to in be made, su such that the council said that if certain cuts weren't made, it, it, that the council itself uh, would, uh, if certain savings weren't shown, the council itself would mandate the yeah. cuts. What we did, uh, the mayor had told us, and he did send a, a, a correspondence to us yesterday, and he had told us that he wanted to reduce uh, uh, 790 some, I believe it was, uh, positions, 750 positions, and the council members felt uh, that they, they'd like to have more positions cut. So what the council member said was, recognizing the executive has to provide uh, uh, um, basic information, was give us the list of the positions. Uh, and uh, if you don't want to do it, then, then we'll by emergency action do it. But uh, it was just a, a discipline for ourselves as much as for uh, the mayor to just say we're going to do it. Um, what, uh, we had extended discussions yesterday amongst ourselves. First, the suggestion was, well, let's just go it and put, put it out there. But I said, well, we're getting the fiscal year 96 budget. So we will work it into the budget so you don't have a problem of the budget not reflecting what we're doing. Um, and I talked to the mayor last night. He said he was going to try to reduce 50,000, I mean, 4,000, excuse me. And, and this fits there. Our, the, our 1,200 on top of the 2,750 we already did uh, is uh, within that, that 4,000. So I, I don't see of the problem. Um, the post, um, the, the press looks for problems between us. Uh, I think they know we've been trying to work together closely. So you think this, this, this difference is being discussed can be reconciled? Yeah, I think so. Uh, 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 and, and we, we didn't think it was something that, that couldn't be done. And we think that that can be done. And I noted earlier that the $244 million worth of reductions that he said uh, that it had some basis in uh, all, we had already done, uh, pointed out that, uh, um, that well, I don't have it right here now, but that a lot of the reductions that he was proposing, we had already budgeted that reduction. In some areas, he reduced less than we said to reduce. In some areas, he reduced more than we said to reduce. Uh, and I, I think we're working in a, a concerted way. Uh, uh, I'm not seeing this, this great difference. I mean, 
press sometimes goes and says, well, the mayor is at 795 and the council's at 1200. Uh, they're at war with each other. I'm, I, don't, I don't see that right now. Uh, but the council has said it, if it doesn't get done, it's going to go on and do it. It's just it's self-discipline, really. Mr. Norton, I think that uh, way I read what you probably read, and it should not reflect the majority of the council, there are some members of the council who have a different view on some of these matters than me. For instance, there are some members of the council, for whatever reason or another, uh, who want to fire more people. But the majority of the members of the council and I are about to be very close together on, on the goals of reducing this budget. Uh, finally, uh, l let me ask a question on uh, your own personnel authority, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, what proportion of the uh, district's personnel authority is under your direct uh, control? While we're getting it, I, I can give you some. Well, let me uh, get that to you, but let me give you uh, generally where uh, we are in terms of the, the big items. One third of the 32,000 FTEs we talked about is in the public school, not under my authority. The university is not under my authority. Uh, the courts are not under my authority. The pretrial, public defender, uh, D.C. School of Law, but let me give you a list of it, but a number of the big agencies are not under my authority. Uh, my staff is saying about 55%, but I don't want to be held to that number. Let me just take the agencies and send them to you tomorrow as to the that. FTEs, and those are not under my authority. Well, the big I one is the that. schools. One third of our FTEs is in the schools where I have no authority. Well, you do have bottom line authority. Well, you have, there. what you have, Mrs. Norton, is that, uh, for instance, the council and myself agreed to, to reduce the school's budget by $31 million. And we had recommended that most of those cuts come out of the central administration, not out of the classroom. And lo and behold, the schools did 300 out of the classroom and 107 out of the central administration, which means even when you put a bottom line on them, with some language saying you ought to do it this way, they did it another way. Uh, by the way, I, I can't believe there would not be some way to, 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 to uh, indirectly get at that problem by saying to, for example, the school board, if you take it out of teachers, we will, we will take retribution on your budget for next year. I mean, it seems to me that without invading their budget, uh, since their budget has to go through the council and has to be approved uh, by you and by the council, there would be ways uh, to have an effect upon where they decide to cut and where they don't cut. What happens to Ms. Norton, you tell them that for 95, you say we're going to reduce you further in 96 because you didn't cut in central administration in 90. Five, then 96, they don't do it. It just becomes a never-ending battle. Yeah, it's but it may be, it might get them to do what you want them to do, and you might not have to. In two or three years, maybe. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm through. You're back. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Chairman Clark, and Mr. Pullman, Mr. Nunn, uh, all the council members who have sat here uh, showing their interest. Uh, we want to thank you very much for coming. You could say you've been saved by the bell because we have another vote, and I think instead of another round of questioning, um, we'll count this as the beginning of a long dialogue. They say a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step, and I think we've taken some giant uh, steps today. We, we're going to have our differences as we move along. I would just, one admonition, and that is to the extent there's downsizing to be done and the council doesn't do it, you have somebody else with probably less sensitivity uh, who may make those cuts. So I think you need to stand up and, and uh, uh, fulfill the, you, you know, your elected obligations as we work through these numbers. And we'll continue to work with you. 
Uh, these first steps are not the, the, the total steps. We're going to be with the city, uh, I think, every step of the way uh, as we move forward. Uh, let me turn it over to Chairman Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I enjoyed uh, the better part of the day with you and with the members of the district government and, uh, and those, uh, those of you who have sat through all of this. Uh, I would just end by saying I, I really believe that there is a, maybe a fundamental difference of opinion here. I think that uh, I don't certainly can't speak for the Congress, but I do know a lot of members of Congress don't believe it's a revenue problem. They believe it's a management problem. A city of 550,000 people should be able to keep a $4.5 billion budget under control and, and deal with the problems that a, that a thriving uh, modern American city sh uh, uh, has. And um, it, it's going to be the revenue that's going to be focused upon for sure, but it's also going to be the management. Chairman, let me just say I uh, appreciate the dialogue we've had with you and Mr. Walsh and with the Speaker and Ms. Norton and others, and you have my commitment to hanging here together and to, to work together. I think, Mr. Walsh, as we go down this road together, uh, we're probably going to meet somewhere in the middle where it's going to be both a revenue and management problem, which I've said. And you said it's a revenue problem, not a management, but I think as we examine it very carefully, away from the glare, the glare, the glare of these hearing rooms, but in dialogue and discussions, we're going to probably come closer together than any of us would think about that, because none of us want to do anything that's not going to make our city a better place to live, work, and, and do business, and make it hospitable for the Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you. Meeting will be adjourned. Thank you all. Here's a, here's that. I don't know what he mean by that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Wednesday's hearing took place a day after House Speaker Newt Gingrich met with Mayor Barry and other D.C. officials. The Speaker outlined a legislative program aimed at aiding the District of Columbia government. Monday morning on C-SPAN 2, see live coverage of a forum on welfare reform. The American Public Welfare